Thanks so much for the warm welcome. Paul and I definitely feel at home when we come to Aberdeen, so thank you for making us feel part of the family. It's wonderful to be here. Now this morning, um, well, have you ever seen the TV series Come Dine With Me? Yes. Well, my eldest daughter, she was like fanatical about it. So every time we went to visit her, I got to watch it. And uh, it's, you know, it's a really entertaining TV show. But I suppose, you know, I, I was trying to think of anybody kind of well known that I could have, you know, lived on the stories of eating out with famous people. Um, and I was thinking, I was wrecking my brains. And then I thought, well, well, of course, I get to come to Aberdeen and I eat out with Ian and Elizabeth. So, and, uh, so they're my claim to fame. But um, Paul, my husband, um, he never lets me forget the invitation that he got to Buckingham Palace. It came, you know, several years ago, beautifully embossed, gilt, and all the rest of it. And, and he got this inv invitation. And, of course, he has dined out on that story so many times. And I bet you he's told you about it as well. Um, he doesn't ever he'll still let me forget about it. And even when he had the invitation, he used to hold it up and go, eh, I don't see your name in it on this anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so I was reminded constantly, I didn't get the invitation. But I suppose if you did get an invitation to come down with royalty, you would live on the good of that for quite a long time. And in our story today, there is a young man who gets invited to come down with the king. And his name is Mephibosheth. And if you've never heard Mephibosheth's story, that's what we're going to talk about today. Actually, when Paul heard that I was speaking about Mephibosheth, which isn't an easy word to say, I have to say, he has whispered all morning in my ear mispronunciations of it. <laughs> so that's how much support I get from my husband when I'm speaking. So Mephibosheth's story is, is a very sad story, but in the, in the end, it is the most wonderful story where he gets this invitation to come to the king's table. We read about him. His story is that his grandfather was King Saul. His father was Jonathan, who was best friends with David. And we hear that whenever Saul is killed or he, he kills himself, he falls on his own sword on the battlefield. Jonathan and his other sons have, have been killed in the battle. And word comes to Jezreel, which is where Mephibosheth was, and he was only five years old. And they come and they say, your grandfather's been killed, your father's been killed, you need to get out of here. And his nurse picks him up, and in her haste as they're fleeing, she drops him. And this little boy, he, he suffers, the Bible talks, talks about it as he is lame in both his feet. For the rest of his life, he suffers this physical disablement. And so he disappears off the scene. He goes to live in a place called Lodabar. He lives in somebody else's house. He goes sort of under the radar because he doesn't want anybody to know where he is. He, he, he feels that his life is going to be in danger. And he, he also doesn't want people to be reminded that he it belongs to the house of Saul and that Jonathan was his father. But many years later, David remembers that he made a promise to Jonathan. They, you know, the Bible describes their friendship in the most wonderful way. These two guys had a close friendship, a close bond. They loved each other and, and they made promises to one another. And um, Jonathan had said to David, David, even when all of your enemies get to be defeated, please don't forget, you know, my family. Don't forget to be kind to my family. And David promised Jonathan that he would do that. And so after David is established as king, he remembers his promise to Jonathan. And he brings a servant in who used to serve in Saul's household. And he says, is there anybody left from Saul's household, is there anybody left in his family that I could show kindness to? And Ziba tells him that there is somebody and his name is Mephibosheth. So David issues this invitation to Mephibosheth to come. Now, Mephibosheth must have come in fear and trembling because you see, it was common in those days if a king was defeated, 
that actually all of his wider family would have been wiped out. They would have been murdered. They would have been killed. That was what often happened. And that's why Mephibosheth had fled. That's why his nurse had grabbed him and ran. So Mephibosheth wouldn't have known what to expect. He wouldn't probably, he was only five years old when his dad died. He probably didn't even understand the bond that was between David and Jonathan. So he comes in fear and trembling to the king. And I want us to read what happened when they met. We read about it in Samuel. And if you turn to 2 Samuel, it'll come up on the screens as well. It's 2 Samuel chapter 9. And this is what happened. Verse 6. When Mephibosheth, son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, came to David, he bowed down to pay him honor. David said, Mephibosheth, at your service, he replied. Don't be afraid, David said to him, for I will surely show you kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan. I will restore to you all the land that belonged to your grandfather, Saul, and you will always eat at my table. Mephibosheth bowed down and said, what is your servant that you should notice a dead dog like me? Then the king summoned Ziba, Saul's steward, and said to him, I have given your master's grandson everything that belonged to Saul and his family. You and your sons and your servants are to farm the land for him and bring in the crops so that your master's grandson may be provided for. And Mephibosheth, grandson of your master, will always eat at my table. Now Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. Then Ziba said to the king, your servant will do whatever my lord the king commands his servant to do. So Mephibosheth ate at David's table like one of the king's sons. How amazed he must have been at David's kindness. David wasn't just inviting him for a one-off dinner. He wasn't just inviting him to be a guest. He was offering him a permanent seat at the king's table. And he restored to him all of his grandfather's land and gave him servants to work it and to provide for him. And I suppose we have to ask ourselves the question this morning, why did David do it? He didn't have to do it. Why did he do it? And it was because of two things. He did it because of love. And he did it because of a promise that he had made. Those were his two motivations. David loved Jonathan. He was his dearest friend. So it was out of love, but also he'd made this binding promise, which the Bible often refers to as a covenant, that David had made this covenant with his friend that he would never cut off kindness from that family. And so that was David's motivation. But the amazing news this morning is this, that you and I get an invitation to come dine with the king. Every single person in this room, there isn't one person here this morning who hasn't got the invitation to come dine with the king. In fact, if you can use your imagination just for a minute and just think and see that that invitation is sitting in your hand right now. The, the same way as Paul got that invitation from Buckingham Palace, and it was, you know, it wasn't on cheap paper. It was really good paper. It was beautiful. It was beautifully printed. It had guilt around it. You have got an invitation from the King, King Jesus, to come and dine with him. He has given it to you. What I would love to be able to do so that we would underline it in each of your lives is, I'd love to go around and take each one of your hands and say, you've got an invitation. You've got an invitation. You have an invitation to come to the king's table. But I'll only demonstrate it because I know Kat and she won't be embarrassed. I'm just going to take her hand. But this is what the Lord wants to do with each one of you this morning. He wants to take your hand. He wants to say, look what I've put in your hand. I've put an invitation in your hand to come to the table and dine with me. Will you come?
Will you come? That's what Jesus is doing for each one of us this morning. Kat has heard that invitation. Many of you have heard the invitation and you have responded and you're coming to the table. But for some this morning, you've never come and he wants you to respond. In fact, even as I take Kat's hand, often whenever I'm speaking, I find that the Lord prompts me to give a word of encouragement to people. Um, in this church, we believe in the gifts of the Holy Spirit, and one of those gifts is prophecy. And part of prophecy is bringing God's heart of encouragement to individuals. And so when I do that, it's to bless you and encourage you, but pray over it and make sure it's what the Lord's saying. Even as I take, take Kat's hand this morning, I can't help feeling, Kat, that when you responded to that invitation to come to this table, it's you have never lost your sense of delight that, that you received that invitation. There's something about you that it's almost like you're the little girl who is always delighted that you got invited to the birthday party. It's like there's something of that childlike joy in you because you knew what it was to sit at an empty table. And when God brought you to this table, it brought so much delight in your heart. And even as I was holding your hand, I felt like the Lord was saying, because of your delight in being brought to the table, it's almost like I could see your pockets full of all of these invitations. And you are that person who very willingly hands out the invitation to others. And you do more than that. You don't just hand them the invitation, but just like I took your hand, you take their hands and you said, come on with me come with me. And I feel like God's going to even increase that for you, that he's going to give you divine appointments of people. And it's almost like you know that you've got an invitation in your pocket with their name on it. And he's going to give you real wisdom and discernment as you give those invitations out. But there's something, you need to know that there's something about when you ask, there's an anointing on that asking that draws people to the table. And when we sit at this table, if you have already received the invitation and you're sitting at the king's table, there's nothing better than asking other people to join you because at this table, there are, there are amazing things that we get to receive. God did it for us on the same basis that David did it for Mephibosheth. He did it because he loves us and he also did it on the basis of a promise made. It's called a covenant. In the Old Testament, God made a covenant with Israel. And God basically said to Israel, you know, if you will follow me, if you will obey my commandments, if you will love me, then I will take care of you, I will provide for you, I will be your God. But you know, when we come into the New Testament, God makes another covenant with humanity. It's a new covenant covenant. And it is an amazing covenant and promise that he makes to us. He says that if he makes a promise to us on the basis that when we accept Jesus and all that he has done for us on the cross, he promises to forgive us. He promises to fill us with his Holy Spirit. And he places his life and his truth on the inside of us. It explains it in Hebrews chapter 10. Um, in Hebrews, Jeremiah's prophecy is quoted, and it says, this is the covenant I will make with them after that time, says the Lord. I'll put my laws in their hearts. I write them on their minds. And then he says this, their sins and lawless acts, I will remember no more. You know, if you accept the king's invitation today to come and take a seat at this table, you're going to experience this love, and you're going to benefit from the promise and the covenant that he makes. But when you come, what can you expect at this table? You know, if you were invited to the palace, you would be thinking, you know, wonder what they're going to serve up. Actually, whenever I started to go out with Paul, um, my, you know, his family actually were sort of known as having a wee bit of money. And um, so my mother was totally intrigued whenever I got invited to go for tea. And she's going, I wonder what they'll give you to eat. You know, and she was, you know, imagining all these fancy dishes that they were going to serve up. And anyway, I went and came home and said, well, what did you get to eat? And I said, um, a fry. A fry. And my mother said, I'll forgive 
you a fry? She says, I wouldn't give anybody a fry if I invited them for tea. She said, that's ridiculous. And she was completely affronted that they served me up with a fry. Um, so when you're going to be invited to the palace, you might imagine what it is that you're going to eat. Well, this is an amazing table. And I just want to take a few minutes to unpack for you some of the things that you're going to enjoy at the table. And many of you, as I've said, have come and you've accepted God's invitation and you've come to the table. But sometimes we forget what he's spread out in front of us. And I really believe the Lord wants to open our eyes again to see what we get to eat at this table. And the first thing is we get mercy and grace. We get mercy and grace. David wanted to show Mephibosheth kindness. Well, do you know what God's kindness looks like? It looks like his mercy and it looks like his grace. Mercy is that God doesn't give us what we deserve. He withholds judgment from us because Jesus died on the cross for us. But grace is that we get what we don't deserve, that he pours out his love and his favor on us. God loves you unconditionally. When you get this invitation, you don't have to think, oh my goodness, what am I going to wear? You know, I need to go out, if you're like me, you need to go out and buy a new dress. I need to clean up. I need to look my best. No, 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 no. For this invitation, you come as you are because he loves you unconditionally. And that is great news for people in this room this morning. God loves you unconditionally. And as you get what you don't deserve and you come to the table. And unfortunately, too many Christians who've already responded to the invitation, we sit at the table and we continually try to scrub up because we don't really get it that he loves us unconditionally. But if we can just allow the Lord to open our eyes this morning, that as we sit at this table, it is a banqueting table. What does the Song of Solomon say? It says, he brought me into his banqueting house and his banner over me is love. It is a banqueting table. This young lady, you've just looked up and you've looked and I'm looking into your eyes and I just really believe that the Lord is underlining for you today. This is a banqueting table. God says at this table, you're not on a diet. You don't have to watch what you eat. And I feel like the Lord is in the process at the moment in your life of providing a real feast for you. There are things that as yet you haven't tasted of him that he is bringing into your life. I feel like God is feeding you up for purpose. It's like he's, I, I just see you growing and developing and he's putting stuff into you at the minute, but it's for purpose. Because I feel like as you start to learn to taste these new things in God and taste different aspects of who he is, it's because of what God is preparing you for in terms of where he's going to put you, how he's going to um, position you. And then some of those things that you've tasted are going to be the things that you will in turn feed others with. God says, don't diet at the minute. You eat everything that I put on your plate because it's for purpose. And you will find that it will nourish you and feed you, but it will also prepare you for what the Lord has in your future. It's a banqueting table. It's not like a wee light tea. We can just all dig in and enjoy the good things that God has for us. But at this table also, we receive forgiveness and reconciliation. That's what happened for Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth's grandfather, Saul, had been David's greatest enemy. He hated David. He wanted to destroy him. But David forgives and he seeks reconciliation with his grandson. And when we come to the table, what do we get? We get forgiveness. God forgives all of our sin. And we get to sit down and there's reconciliation between us and the Father. Because you see, the Bible explains very clearly that it's our sin that separates us from God. There's a brokenness in the relationship. And that's why Jesus came. He came so that we could know God, so that our sins could be forgiven and we could be reconciled to God. And so you come to the table this morning and you can know complete 
forgiveness. And you can know this amazing reconciliation with Father God. And I suppose as we sit at the table and we understand afresh that that's what God has done for us, the challenge comes to us as Christians. I've been forgiven. I'm sitting at this table and I am totally and completely forgiven. Is there somebody in my life that I need to release forgiveness to? And listen, as I look around this room, I don't know your stories. And I understand that some of them will be incredibly painful. But Mephibosheth's story was incredibly painful. He was a broken person living in Lodabar. That means, you know, a nowhere land, a land without pasture. It was almost like a, a hopeless place. And he came and he received reconciliation and forgiveness. And that's what you and I have received. So whatever your story and whatever has happened in your life, the Lord says, because of my grace in your life, because of my Holy Spirit in your life, I want you to release forgiveness to those who have wronged you. You've eaten this forgiveness. You've tasted it. Now I want you to release it to anyone in your life that has wronged you. And that isn't an easy thing to do. But even this morning as you sit, just thank the Lord for his forgiveness and say, Lord, give me the grace to release your forgiveness to this person in my life that I need to forgive. We taste forgiveness at the Lord's table. The amazing thing is as well, we get freedom from fear and we get freedom from shame. When you sit at this table, God comes and releases you from the fears that have gripped your heart. And he also lifts off that horrible blanket of shame that some of us carry. Mephibosheth was a person who knew what shame felt like. He felt ashamed of what his grandfather had done. He felt ashamed of his family and of his inheritance. He wanted to be forgotten about and that no one would know that that's what his connections were. And he also knew what it was to live in fear. He lived in fear for his very life. He thought at any moment someone could turn up at his door and that that would be the end for him. So he lived with this sense of shame. He lived in fear. He lived lived with rejection and abandonment. This is what Mephibosheth lived with. But what did David say to him? The first thing he said to him was, Mephibosheth, don't be afraid. You've nothing to fear here. And that's what the Lord says to you this morning. When you receive this invitation, you've nothing to fear. Come to the table. In fact, you can come and bring those fears that you've been carrying for, your, for all of your life, and you can bring them, and I am going to just lift those from you. Every fear that you carry, his perfect love casts out all fear. But sitting at this table is even more wonderful than that because it removes our shame. Shame is such a stronghold in our lives. You know, it is closely linked to guilt, but it's much stronger than guilt. Because guilt says, I have done something bad. But shame says, I am bad. Guilt isn't always a bad thing because guilt leads you to say, I'm sorry, and when you come to God and you say, I'm sorry, he forgives you. He forgives our sin. The psalmist says he forgives the guilt of our sin. He lifts that from us. But if we do not deal with guilt in our lives, shame comes along and takes hold of it and becomes a stronghold. And it starts to affect how we think about ourselves. It starts to make us think, well, I could never come to the table. Nobody would ever want to have an intimate relationship with me. That's a lie from the devil. And we need to understand that when we come to this table, God lifts all the shame from us. You know, we get to have a new beginning when we come to Christ. The Bible says the old is gone, the new has come. Sometimes we carry shame because of things we have done. But you know, sometimes we carry shame for things that have been done to us. 
that were never our fault or our responsibility. And God says, come to this table. Let me wrap you up in my arms of love and let me take away your fear, but let me wash away your shame. That is the wonderful news of the gospel of Jesus Christ that we get to share. Let the Lord lift the shame from you. You know, Mephibosheth is overwhelmed. He says, why would you do this for me? I'm just like a dead dog. A wee while ago, I got to go to Albania, and I was meeting with some women there, and one lady sat and told me what it was like to live under the communist dictator in Albania. And she said, Priscilla, we just lived like dogs. And that's how Mephibosheth felt. But the Lord brings us to the table as David brought him and lifts our shame and shows us our worth and value to him and gives us back our dignity as an individual. You know, in Christ we get a new beginning and he comes and he says, come to the table. Come and let me lift the shame from you. Let me lift off the fears from you. I love the fact that Mephibosheth's name means this. I think the Bible's amazing. Mephibosheth's name means this, one who destroys shame. The very thing where, that he had suffered under, that he had experienced, his name means one who destroys shame. When you come to the table, whatever the enemy has done in your life to try and take you out, to try and destroy you, the Holy Spirit can take that very thing and turn it around and change your life from being a victim into someone who has victory in Christ. And just for many of you this morning, the Lord's underlining that. Do not allow the devil to think because of what you have gone through in your life that that's it. God wants to take the very thing that you've experienced and it's almost like the sword that the devil has used to pierce your heart with. He says, you turn it back and you use it to defeat the enemy. There's a young woman and you're sitting three rows from the back and you're in a black polo neck sweater and your hair's back. You're sitting right on the edge of the row. And you know, for you, the Lord is just really saying to you, you know, I have given you a new beginning. I have given you a new beginning. I don't want you to be looking back over your shoulder. I don't want you to look back to what's been before. I feel like the Lord is saying, you know, I'm right behind you. Um, that the, you're in relationship with the God who is in front of you, but there's a sense in which God wants to cover your back. And, and, he, and I feel like that's what the Lord said to you this morning. I've got your back. I've got your back. You know, at times you have felt in a very vulnerable place and in a very exposed place. And the Lord says, I've got your back. You're not in that vulnerable place anymore. You're not in that exposed place anymore because I am for you and I'm going to protect you. But I think because of that, God is saying, I'm putting a fresh courage in you that some of the healing that God is pouring into your life, God is going to use that it will pour out of you and that you in turn will use what you've experienced in God to touch the lives of others. And the very thing that at times troubled you, you will be quick to spot it in others, but then you will also be quick to say, and here's the solution I found in Christ. And so for all of us, he takes away our shame. And at this table, the one thing that we get is relationship. You know, that's what tables are about, aren't they? You know, it's so, I love sitting around a table with friends and family. It's my favorite thing to do. Table is always about relationship. There's nothing worse than eating on your own. I hate it. I mean, the odd time I'll go in and have a coffee on my own, but these days you can whip out your phone and sort of flick through it and so that people will know that you're not a sad and sorry individual because I do have 50 friends on Facebook. So, you know, I might be having coffee on my own, but I'm not a loner. And, uh, and we, can, we can do that. But, you know, the table was always meant to be relational, wasn't it? And, and so at this table, we get relationship. We get relationship with the Father, but we get relationship with each other as well. We, we learn what it is to be the family of God together as we come to the Father's table. Table. David told Mephibosheth that he had a permanent place at this table, and it says that Mephibosheth became as one of the king's sons. You get to be part of the family of God. 
You get to be part of God's family. And he calls you his children. And I, I know now as a mom and a grandmother, there's nothing that does my heart more good than when all the kids, our girls all live away, when they all pile home and all the grandkids pile home and we haven't space for everybody, but we're sitting, you know, elbow to elbow at the table. It just does my heart good. And that's what this table is all about. It's the, you get to be included. You get to be a child of God. You get to be as a, a son of God. And I always say to us as ladies, you know, we need to get our heads around the fact that we're sons of God, because that is an important spiritual truth, because it means that we get to be those who inherit. And you need to understand that you're a son of God. The guys get their heads around the fact that they're part of the bride of Christ. We get our heads around the fact that we're sons of the living God. At this table, there's relationship. And then finally, there's restoration and provision. You know, Mephibosheth gets everything restored to him. David provides for him as well. He says, here's your soul, your grandfather's. This is, these were his lands. This was what belonged to him. Now it's yours, Mephibosheth. And he gets things restored to him. And then David says, and I'm going to make sure you're provided for because I'm going to get the servants to look after the farm and make sure that you're provided for. So when you come to this table... You get provision and you get restoration. The things that the enemy has robbed you f from you, the things that has caused brokenness in your life, then Jesus has come. I want to restore to you a sense of your worth and value, your dignity. I want to bring healing into your life. And I want you to know that I am your provider. I will provide for you. Even as I say that, my eyes are lighting on my lovely driver from last night. And I can't remember your name. I apologize. You drove um, Elizabeth and I last night. And you know, this whole thing about the provision of God, I just feel as if the Lord wants to underline that for you this morning. As you're sitting at his table and you're someone who loves to feed others. You, I mean, I, I, and I'm not saying that prophetically because you said something last night. And I just feel like there's something in you that loves to feed others. Well, God loves to feed you. And he says, there's provision that you need in your life at the moment. Well, he's the immeasurably more God. He will meet your needs immeasurably more than you can ask or think. And, and he rejoices to do that. Come to the table today because he wants to provide for you, but he also wants to restore what's been stolen from you. And so as we come to an end this morning, you know, when an invitation has been issued, it would be remiss of me not to give you an opportunity to say, yes, yes, I, I'm going to come. I'm going to come to the table. Many of you have responded.